to me and I'll give you the key. It's easy. Just keep on hopping, keep on rocking, and don't start stopping. I'm everything you need just to walk the scene. And if you want to make it yeah. big, you give it to me, I'll well. grease it. I believe for you, you wouldn't believe what I see in you, so don't stop. Don't let the dream drop hop. Hold up and make it lovely, make it real, and make it yours. Don't stop. All right, Aaron, I'm super excited to have you on the show. You're all about the same kind of things that I'm into, which is hormone health, and you're big in the functional health and medicine space, and I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I love chatting about health, so I'm, I'm down. I'm down so to talk about it. That's awesome. Well, and today we're going to kind of touch on some things that have become big buzzwords, right? You've got hormones, and you've got also a lot of the... I feel like there's a, a little bit of collision in the functional as well as Western medicine space. And so we can talk a little bit about that. And then also some gut health stuff and how that actually influences our hormones and our overall well being as well. So I think we have a lot of things that we can cover today. And I'm hoping that we can give our audience a good little sampling of all of it. Absolutely. I mean, we're working with with human bodies. So it really does us a massive disservice when we try to like hone in on one thing. We really have to take a step back and understand that, you know, we're like systems on top of systems on top of webs on top of webs. And the more we can truly understand that and have deep reverence for it, I think the, uh, the better we can, the better we can support our overall health. I love it. And it's kind of something that I tell a lot of my clients is, is our whole body is a giant feedback loop. <laughs> like it all is this rhythm and it all works together and it's all one giant thing. It's not just a separate body part here or a separate hormone over there. They all influence and impact each other. And I think that the people that are out there realizing that are the ones that are really helping people instead of just dialing in on one little thing at a time. Yeah, and that's kind of the trouble with over specializing um, and just really honing in on what, you know, we have this conventional medicine, we have all of these specialists, right? But they're not really communicating with one another. And so you have like a doctor for your kidneys, you have a doctor for your, you know, for your endocrine system, you have a doctor for your, your psyche. And, and they're, what we fail to realize in this model is that they're actually all interconnected. And I, my fear is that as much as I love functional medicine is that we're kind of slip sliding into that very same ideology with functional medicine where people are getting overly specialized, but they're sort of missing the forest for the trees. And that to me is, is just, just, just kind of like the same problem with like a different t-shirt on or something. Oh, yes, I can totally see that happening too. And it's so it's really funny that you mentioned that, but you have a lot of people now that are honing in on one thing or another, and they're failing to see that they all impact each other. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, it's a big, it's a big deal. So before we dive into this rabbit hole too deep, because I think that it can go there. Um, can you tell my listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do and what got you going into this stuff? Absolutely. Um, and I always like, so I, I have my own podcast. I've been podcasting for almost five years now. And so I'm at the point where I'm like telling people what my, my guests, like keep it short because we start tucking into our story and it's like, it all started on a dark and stormy night. <laughs> like we go all the way back. So in a nutshell, I am a functional medicine nutritionist and I, um, I, currently actually train other clinicians in functional medicine modalities. Um, but it, I got started in nutrition and dietetics. I went to school to get my, um, my undergrad degree, probably like 15 years ago, I think, uh, because like so many other women, I had convinced myself I was broken and I was a project that needed to be fixed. And so I was like, oh, great. I'll go to school for nutrition and I'll just fix myself right back up because that is the the societal programming that we get is that all we need to do is you know change your diet restrict a little bit more get a little bit skinnier and you're good to go um i was also struggling with 
uh, at that point, a decade of disordered eating. And so I was like, I knew, I know I have to, I have to heal this. I have to fix this. So I'm going to go to school and fix myself and uh, it did not work out that way at all. So when I graduated, I realized that I needed to find another path for my recovery. And that's when I really started like deep diving into alternative health. Back then, functional nutrition wasn't a thing. Quite honestly, functional medicine wasn't, there wasn't even a name for it at the time. And so I kind of um, had to figure my own recovery out. And in the mix of that, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune illness and just a lot of health challenges were thrown at me um, throughout my life. And I really had to navigate those on my own because there was very little answers in support that I was receiving through the conventional model. And I think that that's just really like an allegory of so many people in our world right now is that like we have these really complex chronic health issues and we have very few answers. And that honestly, it's just gonna be so traumatic. Um, if some, if, you know, if your listeners are going through something and it, whether it's IBS, chronic fatigue, autoimmunity, and they have no answers, like it, it feels very unsettling to the overall system because, you know, for a different, a number of different reasons, which maybe we can get into later. Um, so I just wanna, I always wanna say like, I see you, I got you. Uh, but that's essentially why I got into what I get into now is to give people answers and hope that feel really hopeless. I love that. And I have a similar story and it's so funny how so many of us, our mess becomes our message, right? It's like, oh, okay. I had to sort through this. And just like you, I felt like I was totally failed by the traditional standard medical ways. And when I started discovering all this other crazy stuff, it just sent me on this trip. So I think I'm still on this trip and it's a constant learning curve. And I'm sure that you look back at all of your, your ways of thinking in the past and, and things that you learned and you're like, Oh, well then now this makes perfect sense. Definitely. What a long, strange trip it's been. Um, but you know, hindsight is, as they say, 2020. And I just, it's so wonderful to like go through hell and to understand like, oh, there are reasons for it. And I think that chronic illness, if you, if you accept the challenge, uh, chronic illness, the gift that it presents is to change, like fundamentally change the things in your life that aren't working. That's, that is honestly like some of the biggest work that I do. I mean, yes, I run functional labs. Yes. You know, we, we put, we, we change people's diets and, and all of that. Um, but like at the crux of it, it is getting radically honest with ourselves, looking around our life and saying, what's not working? Where am I bleeding out? Where am I over-functioning? Where am I over-giving in order to feel like a worthy individual, right? Where am I shrinking myself? Where am I trying to like morph myself into this version that I think is palatable to the rest of the world? And holy smokes, if that doesn't have like real physiological effects inside our body, I don't know what does. And that is honestly the way out. You know, I think we're, what we have to understand is that we cannot, you know, it's been said we can't heal in the same environment in which we got sick. But even if you're not sick, even if you're dealing with like hormone imbalance or gut dysfunction, the same is true. Like we really have to address the environment. And that is, that's a big job. You know, it's a really big overwhelming task sometimes. <laughs> You know, it's funny that you bring up the environment because that's something that I also bring up as well, because people don't realize like when they have people looking at their symptoms or their issues or want to treat them, whether it's a functional medicine practitioner of some kind or a regular medical doctor, they don't, a lot of people aren't asking the questions that really matter. It's not to me, it's not, I mean, nutrition is a piece of it. Obviously we all know that, but there's a lot of other things that are impacted like our stress and our sleep and, and all of this stuff that really contributes to how our body handles our nutrition. So I'm glad you kind of brought up the environment as well. Yeah. I mean, it's just back to what we were saying at the start, which is it's all, it's all interconnected. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what are some challenges that you have had to overcome throughout your career and doing the stuff that you're doing? Because we're programmed to think a certain way as far as healing goes. I mean, it, how, where do you start with people and, and how, how have you had to kind of mold your way of thinking to change as far as helping people reach their goals? Um, I think the biggest struggle for me as a clinician has been to really trust my path, even though it has looked different than other people's and to just continue to trust that, that if it's on my heart, it's, it's important for me to speak about. And the reason that I say that is because I started my practice you know, a decade ago, really catered more towards disordered eating and um, emotional eating. And what I found was that it was just an influx of people wanting to lose weight. And I could not, even though that's, that's, that's what the people wanted, right? And I could absolutely have grown a thriving career off of off of that and it would have made sense on paper everything in in my being was like this is not your way and the more that i worked with women the more that i saw this driving force this this perpetual quest for the holy grail of weight loss was actually making us sicker and sadder and less satisfied with our life. And it was contributing to a lot of dysfunction. I have a, of, of a theory that this, you know, when we're, when we're putting these impossible standards on ourselves to look a certain way, to be a certain way, to act a certain way, we are always going to come up shorthanded. We're always going to fail. The system is rigged. You know, <laughs> it's like, we're always going to fail. And yet we just keep staying in the same system, like a cog, you know, in the machine. And what that does is it creates so much shame and so much self-hatred. And it's so true that our body, our physical body really is influenced by the thoughts that we think. And this is not just like woo woo anymore. Like we've got that like hardcore science to back this up, which I am so thrilled about. And if we're constantly feeding ourselves these really disempowering, negative, self-flagellating thoughts, the body's going to respond. And so I truly do not believe it's any coincidence that I struggled with eating disorders for 13 years. I recovered and then I ended up with an autoimmune illness, which is essentially the body attacking itself. I had been in training for that my entire life, right? And so we see this we know that autoimmunity is way more common in women, way more common in women. And so we have to start to like really pattern assess and say, what is going on here? What is the epidemic? You know, this, this burnout epidemic, is it really more of like, we're just trying to be perfect in a world that tells us we can never win? <laughs> like we're, we're just this perpetual quest to like be this one thing that we can never really get to. What does that do to our physical bodies? I'm telling you what, it's not good. And so I guess the challenge for me was to help people connect the dots because I began to see it so clearly. And I felt like I was sometimes fighting an uphill battle uh, because we're so societally and cultural, culturally programmed to look at things one way. And I'm like, Hey, how about this massive paradigm shift? Like, are you up for it? You know? And so that was the struggle, which is no longer a struggle because I have so many people that buy in because they're freaking ready. They're ready for a change. Oh my goodness, girl. You said so many things that resonate in so many ways with me. I love every portion of that. And, and that is a place where I find myself, right. Is I don't ever, I don't really want to advertise weight loss. Right. And so people don't want to come to me because I'm not advertising weight loss. But like I try to say, I'm like, oftentimes when you find health, you find the body that you want to be in. It may not be the body that is the one on the cover of a magazine because that's completely unrealistic, but we are dealing with these societal standards and social media, which has made it even worse that make us think that we need to look a certain way in order to have value, which is totally not okay. And I have to thank my path, um, which you may not know much about, but 
I thought that if I worked out a, a ton and I was a bodybuilder and I did all these things and I looked a certain way that I would be happy. And I can tell you what the, the worst time in my life was when I was bodybuilding and I was shredded and I had so much emotional turmoil and I was unhealthy. I didn't feel good. And I saw these flaws, even when I was a size zero and I would looked amazing, you know, like I saw these flaws and I would pick them apart. I would literally send my coach pictures and I'd be like, but there's cellulite right there. And there's this and there's that. But the thing about it is, is that allowed me to learn what is feasible for the female body and what is not. And I think we are so polluted with these ideas that if you work out enough and you starve yourself enough, you can look a certain way, no problem. And you have these coaches out there that are saying the same thing. And we are literally between being a mom or a busy power woman or whatever we are, we are, and then trying to look a certain way, we are driving ourselves into the ground and we're just totally obliterating our health in the process. Obliterate, obliterating our health. And I think a lot of it has to do with like our people pleasing tendencies and how we're, you know, for those of us who are uh, raised female, um, we are really told that our comfort level should play second fiddle to everybody else. Our needs should be put on the back burner because it's really our duty to show up to be the good girl, to keep everybody else around us comfortable. And one way to do this is to look a certain way. So I never want to disparage anybody. If your goal is weight loss, like, listen, that's a very normal reaction to being socialized as a woman in this culture, right? That's a very normal reaction. And it's always my, my belief is that it's everybody's prerogative, right? You get to decide what to do with your body. So if, if your goal is weight loss, I'm not here to tell you that's a bad goal or a wrong goal at all. However, what I can say and the boundary that I can create for myself in my practice is to say, my practice will not put weight loss on a pedestal, right? I'll never do that. When we put weight loss on a pedestal above all else, that's when things really start to fall apart. That's when we start to do really unhealthy behaviors to attain that ultimate goal. And because I've worked with, I say hundreds, probably at this point, it's thousands of women. And because I see lab results on a daily basis, I can tell you what the long-term side effects of that is. And so I'm never going to tell you to do something or help you try to reach a goal that's going to have all of this collateral damage. Like I'll never do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's one place where I'm very upfront about pe with it with people is I'm like, listen, this journey may not look like weight loss. It, and, and if you're coming to me for that, I'm sorry, we're going to find health and then potentially weight loss will be a byproduct of that. Um, and so I like what you're doing with that. It's a really hard thing to tell people like, Hey, we've got to make some changes. And I, and I kind of explain it like this when you've been running in those ruts on the freeway for so long and you need to make a change, you have to get outside of those ruts. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do. And you kind of, your car wants to go back into them constantly, but in order to make new ruts, you've kind of got to do the hard stuff first. Yeah. And like excellence and comfort cannot coexist, right? So this is something that I say in business a lot. I work with entrepreneurs and, and practitioners and clinicians. And that's something like we, we have to get outside of our comfort zone if we want to achieve true excellence. And by excellence, I don't necessarily mean like a, you know, like a, like a physical body standard. I mean, just like it, enjoyment and peace, right? Like enjoying your life and just doing the work that you showed up to do and thriving and all, all of that kind of stuff. But it usually requires some work, unfortunately. Yeah. So let's kind of dive into that because the thing is, is there's so much out there. You, it's a hard balance, right? Because you don't want to be like, okay, this is your new way of doing things. We might have to restrict this. We may have to do that. And so many people have been restricting for so long or trying to stay away from certain things or doing who knows what kind of diet that it's, it's really hard on their headspace. So how do you begin to approach that in a way that people can sustain it? And it's not just another fad. Um, well, I don't, 
I don't do that. I, I, I don't, I am not the clinician for when you're looking to, I, to work individually with me to like help reframe your mindset. Instead, what I do is I pump out a tremendous amount of free content, like hundreds of hours of content. So you can kind of listen, you can kind of like bask yourself in those messages and then make the changes yourself. I, I, I am, I'm really clear about what I'm good at and I stay in my lane. And um, I, how do I wanna say this? I am very clear about who is my ideal client. And it is not somebody that's just dipping their toe in these waters. I think what we have to do anytime, anytime we're trying to change our mindset around anything, it requires a lot of repetition. And so what I tend to encourage people to do is just kind of like bask yourself in those messages, like really curate your, like the, the incoming messages for you. And that includes your social media feed. That includes the, the media that you're consuming, the podcast that you're consuming, the, the books that you're reading, whatever it is, needs to be highly curated. This is how you take responsibility for your change. I am all about self-responsibility and kind of claiming our own space and being like, I'm stepping up to the plate. So the women that I work with are people that are, have a kind of already done that. Like I'm, I'm ready for this. And, um, Honestly, I, I tend to work a lot more with, with GI issues and uh, hormone imbalances. Um, anyway, I might I practice a lot more uh, functional medicine um, versus what it used to be 10 years ago, which was helping women try to jump off the roller coaster of dieting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would like to dissect the GI and hormone thing a little bit with you because sometimes, and I, I'm sure you as well as I, I feel like sometimes when I'm looking at these labs, it's like Groundhog Day. <laughs> It's like the same thing over and over. What are some of the most common things that you see? Um, with, with GI specifically? Yeah. I mean, like in the female space, when people are struggling with hormonal imbalances, um, I find that a lot of times GI and hormones kind of go hand in hand. Um, what are you seeing most commonly that is something that we need to start looking out for or maybe address? Um, I can't say that there's one overall pattern. If I had to pick one, it would probably be burnout, right? Um, burnout can manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, if I, if I had to pick like kind of a general trend from a hormonal perspective, it would definitely be imbalanced cortisol, um, mis, you know, imbalanced DHEA. So the adrenal hormones. And, you know, I think that, I think that what, what can be very, very overwhelming from a consumer standpoint is in terms of like just getting healthy is we have a lot of talking heads saying a lot of different things. And some folks are like really almost like tunnel vision on like, this is the one problem. Like, right, it's parasites. You just need to do a parasite cleanse or it's mold. Everybody has mold issues or it's this or it's that. And I think that if we can, if there was one true thing to focus on, if somebody's like, what's the one thing, the one thing I would say it's the nervous system because the nervous system is going to quite literally dictate every single thing from top to tail in your body. And so when there's an imbalance in the nervous system, we can certainly see that reflected in the adrenal hormones. And this is the first place that I start with folks because healing can't happen if we're all jacked up, if we're in a fight or flight response, right? It just is impossible. Healing and creativity cannot coexist with like fear, anxiety, and stress. Just they're two different channels essentially. And so getting people into sort of that like safety zone or helping them access feelings of safety within their body is so powerful to see hormone imbalance. I don't um, spot treat hormones. I am very much a proponent of self-regulate over replace. So like try to take it from the top down, brain down versus just like going in and being like, oh, your cortisol is low. Let's jack you up with some adaptogens or, you know, like, or your DHEA is low. I'm just going to hammer you with this hormone. They don't really do a lot of that all the time. I'm more about like, how can we change the environment that's causing this massive internal stress? Here's an example. This is something that I was hearing. So I've been hearing a lot lately from um, clients over the past few months. It's like, 
it's so interesting because so many people said this exact same phrase, like I was working 16 hour days and then, and I think pandemic, you know, it was obviously so stressful for us to navigate this time for so many people. If you owned your own business, you know, like you, you were like, here's a hope and a prayer that we can stay, keep the doors open, you're homeschooling your kiddos. But even for folks with a stable paying job, it was almost like they were like on call all of the time. And so their work hours like doubled overnight. And so this massive influx of stress kind of like broke the whole system and they had this like huge uptick in, in symptoms. And so we have to really have some deep reverence for how important nervous system health is, how important our stress hormones are. And that is always the first place that I start before doing a deep dive on hormones and before even doing a deep dive on the gut. That's so I would say that's the, that's the one pattern is nervous system dysfunction, burnout, and kind of being locked into that, that fight or flight tendency. I would totally agree. And I think that's, I feel the same way about a lot of the things that I look at as well is the biggest thing is stress. And it's so hard because so many people feel like they're trapped and they can't change that. They feel like they have to work those 16 hour days and they have to get home and shuttle kids around to a hundred soccer games and and they feel trapped, but you're not trapped. And, and your overall health is the most important thing when it comes to those things. Uh, and, and people don't realize that. So we're so busy working. We feel trapped, especially in careers, I find is one thing. We are so busy working really, really hard to pay for all of these things and to pay for things that give us joy and to pay for our home and stuff. We don't realize that you know, we may need to ch change that path as well. And I know that's a really scary thing for some people, and I'm not saying go out and quit your job, but for some people that may be a great option. I know I personally, for myself, that's exactly what I did after realizing how much stress I was under and how much it was impacting my health. I was like, listen, I, I don't care what I make anymore. I was in a really good career where I made a lot of money, but I didn't care anymore because I knew that if happiness meant not being stressed out all the time, why did I need money to go take my family on vacations and buy things that made me, brought me joy when I could have joy just from not being stressed out all the time? Yeah, it really requires kind of like a buck the system <laughs> paradigm shift, right? In order to, to achieve that. And I think we can, I think we give a lot of our power away. I think we can forget that we are essentially the captains of our own ship. And we get to, I was talking about like, you know, curating your Instagram feed, but you can also curate your life, right? You actually have the power. We get like swept up in this tsunami of like, you know, busyness and being overscheduled and needing to have all of these things. I have a little bit of a theory and I think it's, you know, and, and if this theory does not apply to any of your listeners, it's okay. Like just Toss and aside, not everything has to be for you. But I do have a theory after working with so many people for so many years that we can wear busyness almost like a cloak. And if we can stay busy, if we can just say busy, because you know, like you think about when you when you run into people or you know, when you talk to people, the very first thing that they say is like, I'm so busy. And it doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a, a stay-at-home mom or a college student or you know, a parent working multiple jobs or a retiree, it doesn't matter, like everyone is maxed out. They've convinced themselves that they're so busy. But I think what's happening is that we're wearing it like almost like a protection. Because if I stay busy, if I stay so busy that there's no space for me, that I actually don't have to face the really hard truth of like, hey, this life actually isn't working for me. Or, or to do, sometimes we know, because like, you know, our intuition always knows, Sometimes we know, and the thought of doing the thing that we like really should be doing, or like that's on our heart to do, or like the thought like that, that our gut tells us to do, that thought feels so overwhelming that we just stay busy. So we don't actually have to face it head on. And I get it, you know, I get it, but it's also like, what a shame. We have this like one true life. Like, don't you want to go out there and like, kind of like seize it? Or do you just want to stay so busy going to 27 soccer games in one week that there's no space for you, like for you to actually live this life? Um, so yeah, totally. 
Oh, totally. Right. It's a lot easier said than done. Like I can make a meme about it. Actualizing it is a little bit more challenging. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So another thing you kind of talked about was gut health and we kind of touched on stress. How are you finding stress impacting gut health? Is that something that you're finding has a direct correlation? A direct correlation, an absolute direct correlation. So that's, what, that's even what I was like, we, we start with my clients, I start on addressing the nervous system before we even do this deep dive on the on gut. I definitely, so I run a lot of stool tests, right? Um, and there's a trend, I will say, in the functional medicine space to just run these tests and to spot treat. I call it kind of like template medicine. If this, then this. If we see H. pylori, then we do this. If we see this, then we do this. Like the protocol, like we're always looking for the protocol. What I tell people is the protocol doesn't exist. You actually have to think critically. <laughs> uh, sucks, but it's true. To be a good clinician, you have to think critically. And we have to take the whole entire person and the, all of their context into consideration. And one of the most massive things that I will see that prevents people from like achieving good gut health is, is this stress component because it does a number of different things. I mean, it will essentially shut down your, your stomach acid. It will shut down digestive enzymes. I see low digestive enzymes on, you know, probably like 50% of stool tests. Like people are really having trouble doing that. We have to swim upstream. Digestion is a North to South process. It's a top down process. Meaning if there's something wrong here, you have to swim all the way upstream and say, where does it start? I mean, everyone wants to talk about leaky gut. I'm like, okay, there's 24, you know, possible reasons for leaky gut. You don't just treat leaky gut. You're like, you're, you're giving your clients like glutamine, they're mainlining glutamine and maybe some turmeric and maybe some colostrum, but like what caused the leaky gut, right? We have to go all the way up. Um, Another finding that I see quite often is low secretory IgA. And if, if, if somebody has low secretory IgA, it's like they're, they're in, and then they try to do some kind of gut healing protocol uh, to kill the bad guys, then it's like sending soldiers to war with like, you know, like fatigued soldiers to war or something. We're like sending soldiers in to fight, but like not giving them any equipment or not giving them any resources or any food. It's like, you, you don't have a very, uh, you're, you're a lot less likely to win that war. And so we have to say, okay, if secretory IgA is low, what's going on here? Well, it's directed by cortisol. So if you have cortisol imbalance, if you have low cortisol, if you're burnt out, your immune system's depleted. So you're probably not going to be able to just clean up the gut willy nilly. I don't care how much your practitioner has given you oregano oil. All you're doing is dropping an atom bomb on your gut to set you up for more problems in the future. So there's so many different ways that stress impacts the physiology of the gut, that stress impacts the microbiome. Um, so we always have to address that stress piece. And that's the thing that people want to just kind of like just like work around. <laughs> Let me just skip this step and just like give me the gut healing protocol. But unfortunately it doesn't, that's not the way that the human body works. And so I, we're always, always addressing where stress might be coming from in our lives, what's contributing to it and what we can do about it. Cause we have to remember, we have to change the environment that led to this dysfunction. We don't just go right to the dysfunction because if we don't change this, the same situation is going to repeat itself. Absolutely. And you kind of talk about that a little bit too, because you, you were saying back there that you, some people kind of dive into, okay, well, here's an H pylori protocol or here's this. I mean, a, a really popular one right now, and I've used it myself is like a low FODMAP diet. So you're, you're, you don't necessarily think that that is necessarily the right direction to go. Can you kind of tell my listeners why something like that may or may not work? specifically on a low fat FODMAP diet. Absolutely. And I want to just say like, I've been in this space long enough to see trends come and go. And I think it was, it was like probably six years ago, maybe seven, I don't know where, um, I, I was positive. I tested positive for SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Right. And, um, I was laughed out of the, the gastroenterologist's office for mentioning a low SIBO diet, because that was like, she's like, how do you know about that? Don't worry about that. 
you know, like you pee on. Um, and now it's like the absolute zeitgeist of even conventional medicine. Like you come in like limping, you're like, my calf hurts, my knee hurts. And they're like, have you tried the low FODMAP diet? It's like the panacea for everything. Um, I don't, there's nothing inherently wrong with a low FODMAP diet. What I will say is that I, I treat a lot of SIBO in my practice and I don't use a low FODMAP diet. So it is not the only way to handle SIBO. There's a misunderstanding too, is that people utilize a low FODMAP diet as the treatment for SIBO. It is not the treatment for SIBO. SIBO is an overgrowth. It's really a translocation of bacteria, right? There's, there's bacteria where they shouldn't be. And you can't just starve off those bacteria and hope that they go away. You actually have to go in and address the bacteria, kill the bacteria, and then address why th th those bacteria were in the wrong place to begin with. Um, sometimes a low FODMAP diet can be helpful with symptoms and can help to mitigate symptoms short term, short term. What I find is that people are going on, you know, it, because they're just, they're, they're, looking to feel better. So I totally get it. And maybe they read a blog about a low FODMAP diet or somebody told them about a low FODMAP diet. But what that, that restrictive diet can do long-term is actually starve off the beneficial species in our gut. So things like fecal bacter, um, which is our main butyrate producer, we know that, that it takes a hit because we're restricting its food source. And so, um, and the, the reason that that's a problem is because butyrate's the main fuel source for your colon cells. It's potently anti-inflammatory, not just in your gut, but throughout the entire body. So if we lose butyrate, it's not good, right? So we're, we're seeing these beneficial species come down because we're restricting the food source. So we have to understand that these, these, even these therapeutic diets do have collateral damage. And so we just wanna be mindful of that. If we are going on a low FODMAP diet, we just want to understand that. We want to weigh out the pros and the cons so we can make the best decision for us. And so my viewpoint is that the low FODMAP diet should just be used as a short-term intervention, not to mention all the, like the, the mind F that goes along with it. It is not an easy diet to follow, right? It's really, really stressful. And we have to make space. This is my other gripe with functional medicine. As much as I love it, it has its drawbacks just like anything. But we like forget the humanness in people. So we're like, just do this. The research says that intermittent fasting could be helpful for this. But it's like, well, what if the person in front of you is like has a history of restriction and now you're telling them to restrict even further? Like, that's not okay. This is what I mean by template medicine. Oh, somebody has high blood sugar. Doo, doo, doo. My calculation says intermittent fasting is for you. And let's take some berberine. And doo, doo, doo. But like, we have to step outside the protocol and look at the human being sitting in front of us and say, what does this person need? What does this human need, right? Not what does this diagnosis need? What does this human need? And so that's, that is my, you know, I, I was talking about template medicine, but we can all, this can extend to like healing diets as well. So we're just like lobbing these super restrictive diets at people and just being like, good luck out there, you know, without actually as accessing the humanness in the other person, which is like, can you actually do this? How does this feel to you? How does this feel to your nervous system? Like, is this something you think you could manage? No, we're just gaslighting people when they don't comply with the diet. We're saying you didn't do it hard enough. You didn't AIP hard enough, right? You didn't do SCD hard enough. It's your fault. It's the, it's the same, it's diet culture 2.0. It's the same messaging of like, the diet's not the problem. You're the problem. You're the problem that needs to be fixed. And I'm just like not here for that. So low FODMAP diet, short term, if you're going to do it, understand that it has some potential negative ramifications as well. Absolutely. And I love everything that you said there. I think we're totally on the same page with a lot of this stuff. And it's funny because I got asked on a podcast just yesterday, they were like, well, what do you think of intermittent fasting? <laughs> and I was like, here's the thing. It so depends. It really depends. It's not a one size fits all thing. Like there's so many things you have to take into consideration when even thinking about that. And so I can't be like, yeah, you should do that. I said, it depends. And I hate being that person that has to use that answer for everything, but it is true. We are human. We are all so variable and so unique and different. 
one thing that works for somebody is not going to work for the other. Our own situations are all so very unique. If you're in this space and you're not saying it depends to like 95% of the questions flung your way, all that does is just show that you tremendously lack experience or humility, right? If you're coming forward and you're like, this is the solution, the solution, that just tells me, I'm like, oh, okay. So like, I'm going to tune this person out because they actually don't know what they're talking about. Work with like thousands of human bodies and you'll understand that it just doesn't work that way. It's not as simple as that. And everything depends on context, on individual context, right? So and that's what I always say. If somebody is telling you to do like this one thing, you got to run so far in the other direction. Absolutely. And it's so funny because sometimes I feel like, geez, they're probably like, this chick has no idea what she's talking about because she uses it depends as an answer every single time. But unfortunately it does. And there's nothing that I can say is the answer. And that's part of my, my mission with this podcast is people are probably like, well, crap, this chick's all over the place. She's got a keto person and she's got this person and that person. But the thing is, is I want people to hear everybody's end of things and kind of where they're coming at from that standpoint, because some individuals all have such different situations that they're in and what worked for them may not work for you, or maybe it's something you could try. I mean, I feel like there's a, there is a solution for everybody out there and it's not going to be the same for everybody. And so I really like to talk to a, a variety of people to kind of understand where their standpoint is on things and why. I think an important addition to what you just said is that even the things that worked for you at one point may no longer work for you. And we have a really hard time allowing or permitting that truth for ourselves. Like we used to be able to do this, or I used to do this. And now I, I used to eat this way. Our bodies are ever evolving, they're dynamic, like our brains and our body forever changing, shifting. Um, our nervous system is quite literally designed to like interact with the world, to communicate in, right? So the, if the outside world is always changing, which it is, the inner terrain might also need some tweaking, right? So I just wanna say that, which is not to say like you have to change up your diet all the time, but if, if you find yourself in a position where you're like, but this used to work for me and now it doesn't, that's okay. That's kind of normal too. And I just feel like we can get so stuck, so limited to like trying to do things the way that we used to do them. But oftentimes the way that we used to do things got us into a mess, right? <laughs> got us into a bit of a mess. So we need to probably try to change it up anyway. I love all of that. That's so awesome. Um, so out of all of the things that you've learned throughout your career, out of all the messages that you want to get out there to people, what is the most important thing that you would like to get out there to the world, especially for women that they can understand and maybe take to heart? Um, two things I would say. One is that we all have, um, I call it like Wolverine potential, like Wolverine super powers, Wolverine, like the Marvel comic. Um, my family is like super into Marvel comics <laughs> at the moment. Um, but Wolverine has the capacity to self heal and we do too. It's just that we've never been taught that. So we don't realize that it's available to us. And the reason that so many of us humans are not living up to our potential is because we're not in the habit of living up to our potential. And so if we can just truly understand that one truth that your body was designed to heal, that can really change the game for a lot of people. You don't have to work so hard. You just need to give the body the resources that it needs to heal, one of which is downregulating the nervous system. The other thing is um, you need to set boundaries for yourself. And that's a really hard thing for women to do because we are overachievers, like we're, we're our self-worth is so intrinsically tied to showing up and serving everybody else and saying yes, that it's, it's very hard to honor our own needs. And I see this as like such a, such a contributing factor to our overall health. I mean, if you think about like actual on like an actual 
uh, like biological level, like, you know, even just leaky gut, I just throw out leaky gut because everybody loves to sound smart, talk about leaky gut. Leaky gut is quite literally a boundary breach, right? A boundary has been broken. So where in your life is that showing up? And I spend so much of my time <laughs> talking about boundaries for this exact reason. Like, where can you stand up in your life and say, I matter, my needs matter, my voice matters, my health matters, rather than just constantly making else, everybody else the project to be worked on where you're just sitting here like flailing around. So those are the two big things. Your body can heal, but you've got to give it the resources in order to do so. One of those resources is protecting your own space and your own needs by setting boundaries. Well, that was amazing. I so appreciate you sharing that with everyone. If everybody wants to jump over and find you, where do they go about doing that? Um, I would say the, 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 the first two places to start are the functional nutrition podcast. Um, that's functional spelled with a K. And then I'm this, I'm the functional nutritionist on Instagram. Those are the two places that I hang out the most and where you can get like the most goods for me. So I would start there. And I will put all that information in the show notes too. So people can jump over and find you and look more into what you're doing because you're doing some really great things. And I certainly appreciate other people in the field out there sending this awesome message that they can heal themselves and especially talking about stress. That's a great thing. Yeah, indeed. We love to talk about stress, <laughs> get people even more stressed out. Your stress is killing you. Uh, exactly. Well, Aaron, it has been a pleasure. If you have nothing to add, we will wrap up our podcast for today. I am so thankful you decided to join me. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a treat.